Hi everyone, it's Tarrant. And Stella here from Meeple University on the Dice Tower. Thanks for joining us. Today we'll be teaching you how to play 44 BCE, game designed by Christian Forrest, Holt Gray and Kelly Forrest and published by Gray Forest Games. We are using a prototype copy here of the game and so the rules and components may not be final. Let's get to it. 44 BCE, in the aftermath of the assassination of Julius Caesar, and now all of the major players in Rome position themselves to try to take over as emperor. As in any political struggle, it is a shifting landscape of alliances and betrayal. Each round there will be a single leader, the Imperium Maius, and through the playing of cards and distribution of support influence, all other suitors will work together to try to unseat the current leader in at least two of three fields of Rome. But this is an individual game. The cards you play, the buildings you buy, and the fields you win will all contribute to your own individual score. And after six rounds of play, it is the individual player with the most points or Imperium who wins the game. I won't step you through the game setup, but I'll show you what things look like once you're done. And here I'm set up for a three player game. The game plays in six rounds, each represented by a stack of allegiance tiles. Each round plays in nine phases, which will be represented by moving this marker around this track. This field here represents all of the buildings which are available at this point of the game, and they're separated into different sections based on which of the game's round they're relevant to. Buildings which will enter the game in round 2 and round 4 are shown up here. All the cards that you can purchase are shown here, broken into level 1, level 2 and level 3, and each stack has all identical cards in it. All players start with a score of 0 Imperium, and there is a Senate tile here which has an effect in endgame scoring. Each player takes a player board, the matching player screen which starts down, 13 architects who represent the buildings you've constructed, and 5 coins. Then randomly choose an Imperium Maius for the first round, and this is the one player against which all of the suitors will battle. Take Year 1's Allegiance tiles and then place them in their relevant columns above the Imperium Maius's board. You're now ready to play. <music> 44 BCE plays in 6 rounds, and in each round one player is the Imperium Maius and all other players are suitors. Each round plays in 9 phases. The first phase is Build. Players will spend their coins to construct buildings. The second phase is production. Players will gain influence cubes based on the basic income plus any buildings down here that they've built. The third phase is enlist and here players will spend influence to enlist recruit cards. The fourth phase is discard in which players discard down to seven total cards and influence cubes. Fifth is the Imperius Maius commits. And behind the screen, the Imperium Maius chooses which cards to play, which cubes to play, and which ones to store, setting their strength or authority for this round. Sixth is Negotiation, and here the suitors will talk among themselves to work out how they're going to defeat the Imperium Maius this round. Seventh is the Suitor Commit, where the suitors secretly commit their cards and cubes behind their screens. Eighth is Resolution. The screens come down, the influence is distributed, authority in each field is totaled, and the allegiance tiles are distributed to the players who win them. Suitors who support each other are rewarded, and if the suitors want at least two out of three fields, the Imperium Maius will change hands. Finally is the recess phase, in which players gain money income, move played cards and scored tiles into their scoring pile, or collegium, and set up for the next round. After six rounds are complete, there'll be one final build phase where you can spend leftover money on buildings for further points before the final scores are counted and the player with the most Imperium wins. The 
first phase is build, and this takes place in turns, starting from the first player who is the player to the left of the Imperium Mice. On your turn, you can spend coins to construct a building. You can use a building in this building area that you've already constructed, or you can pass. Once you pass, you're out of the phase for the round, and players will keep taking turns around the table until all players have passed. To build a structure, pay the coins shown in the bottom left. This would cost three, this would cost one. After paying, place one of your architect meeples onto one of the spaces for that structure. The architect stays there for the rest of the game and represents the structure that you built. A single player cannot build more than one of the same structure, with the exception of these four pre-printed structures in the bottom right of the board. These two spots are limited to the higher player counts. Your other option is to use one of the build phase structures, and if you do this, lay your architect down to show that you've used it for this round and then resolve the effect. Structures have a variety of effects. They will all give you the Imperium at the end of the game, shown in their top right corners. And those with a phase icon will give you an action or effect in that phase. Buildings with a lightning bolt are a once-off immediate effect when you build it. And statues are all about endgame points, scoring the points in the corner as well as the points from the objective on the tile. Once all players have passed, you'll move to the production phase. Players now take their income, which includes the natural influence shown here, and income for their buildings. Here, orange would get an extra two white influence, blue would get a red influence and a loyalty card. Resolve this phase in turn order because all components are limited, and if there are none left when it comes to you, you miss out. Third is the enlist phase, and like the build phase, this will be resolved in turns, starting from the first player to the left of the Imperium Mias, and going around the table until everyone has passed. On your turn, you can either enlist a card from the display, or activate a building in this portion of the board. All cards are available to be enlisted except for loyalty. Loyalty must be earned a different way. The cost to enlist is printed at the bottom of the card, so Aedilus would cost two white influence, Signifer would cost two red influence and a loyalty card, which you return to the supply, and Praetor would cost two white influence and any one influence of your choice, as indicated by the grey cube icon. In this phase, you'll mostly be paying white, red and brown influence to get cards of the same colour. And this is the main function for these influence types. Yellow support influence can be used to meet these grey cube costs, but they serve a much greater function in the commitment phases later, so you may not be doing that very often. When you enlist a card, place it face up into the matching field of your board. You can have multiple cards in the same field. The fourth phase is the discard phase, and here you must discard down to seven total cubes and cards available to be played. Your limit may be increased as a result of discard phase buildings. Counting towards this limit are all face up or face down cards on your player board, as well as all of your influence. Anything that's already in your collegian pile does not count. This player with no special buildings has nine against a limit of seven, so has to discard down to seven. If you discard influence, it is returned to the supply, and if you discard a card, then flip it face down into your collegian pile, where it will contribute to your final score. This phase is once again resolved in turn order. The next four phases are the Imperium Mias Commits, Suitors Negotiate, Suitors Commit, and Resolution, and this is the main political part of the game. This is where the suitors will work together to try to get the best of the Imperium Mias but at the same time be working against each other to score the most points. I'm going to explain these phases in order, but just be warned that a lot of the context for the choices you're making back here won't become clear until I talk through the resolution phase. So, the fifth phase is Imperium Mias Commits. The Imperium Mias puts up a screen concealing everything but the Allegiance tiles. Then all of the cards and cubes can be distributed around the player's board as follows. White, red and brown cards can be placed face up into the field matching their colour. 
Yellow cards can be played face up into any field. If multiple cards are played in the same field, the order is important. Any card may be played face down into your storage area, saving it for subsequent rounds. Yellow support influence may be played on top of any field. Any color of influence may be played into the charisma box in the center of a field. And any number of influence can be held in storage again for subsequent rounds. Once the Imperium Mias is done, these decisions are locked in for the round and remain secret until the resolution phase. The sixth phase is suitor negotiation, and here the suitors will negotiate and come to some sort of agreement of what they plan to do in the suitor commit phase. This phase is negotiation only, there's no movement of pieces or mechanisms at play. But there are some ground rules. All negotiations happen with the player screens down, and if you have face down cards, you can't show them. All negotiations are open, meaning that if you want to talk to one suitor, all suitors have to be able to hear. The Imperium Mias cannot speak. All negotiations relate to the promise of future actions. You are not allowed to exchange any resources between players. Finally, and most importantly, no agreements are binding. Your aim here is to sound out your opponents to work out what actions you should take, both cooperatively and personally, to further your game the most. Once negotiations are done, all speaking must finish and you'll go on to the suitor commit phase. Players do this simultaneously, silently, and behind their screens. This is very similar to the Imperium Mias commit phase. Players can play cards into their matching fields, play yellow cards onto any field, choose to put cards into storage for future rounds, and may put any color of influence into a charisma box on one of the three fields. Once again, the order of cards in any given stack on a field is important. The core difference for the suitor commit phase is that suitors cannot place support influence on their own fields or cards. This is not allowed. What the suitors can do is commit support influence to another player in one of the three fields. Here, for example, this would be to give a yellow support influence to Mark Antony, whose icon matches, in the military field. As we'll see soon, this is going to help Mark Antony, but it's also going to give Brutus a reward. Suitors can commit any number of support influence to other players in this manner as they like. Once all suitors are done, the screens come down, and it's time for the resolution phase. Here you'll resolve each of the three fields of battle, one after the other, to determine who has the most authority, the Imperium Mias, or all suitors combined. Authority is represented by the number in the yellow circle on cards in that field. The number in a grey box is called ambition, and that does not count as authority unless it has been activated with a yellow cube. For example, this would be one authority, while this would be three authority for a single cube. The first resolution step is to deploy support influence. Here, for example, blue has deployed one support influence to red's white field, and so this cube is moved onto one of the ambition boxes on that card. As a reward for giving support, place a loyalty card above the corresponding field. It must be clear that this is not part of what you've played in the field this turn. It may happen that more support influence has been committed than the player has ambition boxes to fill them. When this happens, the player with the most committed influence breaks the tie and goes first. Here it was two to one, and so Brutus placed the influence. If it's tied, as it now is here at one to one, then the tie is broken by the player with more charisma in that field. So here two charisma to one means that green would place the second influence and gain the reward. If still tied, earlier in turn order breaks the tie. Once there are no longer any boxes for the influence to sit, any further committed influence is wasted. To finish this example off, the green player would gain this influence, because one charisma versus zero, and the red player would get a second loyalty reward. 
When multiple cards were played, influence goes from top to bottom. The Imperium Maius then deploys support, but this simply means the support that was placed on that field is placed from top card to bottom card on the cards played. The Imperium Maius does not earn loyalty for this. Next, you'll activate any loyalty that you've played this round in this field. For the suitors, loyalty allows one yellow support influence to be placed in that field. If you have no place to put that influence, then you don't place anything. However, all loyalty played remains in the field. For the Imperium Maius, any loyalty played allows the placement of two support influence instead of one. Next, all players activate any effects printed on their recruits, or for the Imperium Maius, on the Allegiance tile. And these generally have effects like giving you charisma, more support influence, or extra influence. Now it's time to tally the result. Add up the total authority in the field, which again is the yellow circle, or the grey square as long as it's activated with a yellow cube. Here, Imperium Myers has four authority in political, while the suitors combine for seven. The suitors have won. If it's tied, whichever side has the most combined charisma in that field breaks the tie, and if still tied, the Imperium Myers breaks the tie. If the Imperium Myers wins, they put the allegiance tile in their collegium and take one coin. If the suitors win, then the suitor who has the most authority in that field is the one who gets the allegiance tile. If it's tied, then whoever has the most charisma, and if it's still tied, earlier in turn order. Then each player with at least one loyalty card in that field gains exactly one coin as reward. And that is all of the steps for resolving one of the fields. You'll go through the exact same process to resolve the military field and then the social field. After all three are resolved, check for the new Imperium Myas. If the current Imperium Myas held at least two of the three allegiance tiles, then that player remains in the position, but gains no other rewards. But if the suitors claim at least two of the three allegiance tiles, then the suitor with the most combined authority becomes the new Imperium Myas. Here the count would be four to three to two. If tied, the winner is the one with the most combined charisma, and if still tied, earlier in turn order. The new Imperium Myas then chooses a reward of either one coin or six Imperium. Finally, if you have any resolution phase buildings, resolve them now. And these typically give you rewards for playing a certain type of cards. Here, for example, three Imperium for playing two political cards. Having seen the way resolution works, hopefully you'll now be able to see the sorts of things you'll be negotiating during the suited negotiation phase. If everyone's telling the truth, it's very easy to get these influence cubes distributed where you need to to beat the Imperium Myers. And you're personally rewarded for giving other players help, so it seems like a win-win. But let another player take too many of these tiles, or become the Imperium Myas too many times, and they will move ahead of you on the scoreboard, so you need to be careful. And perhaps try to waste the loyalty cards they played by playing influence over the top of them, because influence is resolved before loyalty, and you don't have to tell the truth about where you're going to play your influence. Finally, it's time for the recess phase. Each player gains an income of one coin unless they are the player or players with the most buildings constructed. Here, orange and red have four each, blue has only three, so blue would be the only one to gain income. Any architects lying down from this round should be stood up. All influence on your player board, except for any that you put in storage during your commit phase, is returned to the supply. All cards that you played, or tiles that you won, are placed face down into your collegium for endgame scoring. Cards you committed to your storage are kept face down, and loyalty you earn for helping other suitors is kept face up. Give the next year's allegiance tiles to the Imperium Minus. If you enter a new era, meaning rounds two or four, then you'll place all of the new buildings for this era into their matching spaces on the board. Then proceed to the next build phase. 
After the recess phase of round 6, you'll have one last build phase before the end of the game. This is a final opportunity to turn your money into points by building the most strategic buildings. Once everyone's passed, the game is over and you'll proceed to end game scoring. For each structure you built, score the points showing in the top right corner. Here for example, 2 points. Statues can be particularly valuable, scoring 5 points plus points for an objective. And note that there's only one slot per statue, so you need to get in quickly. Put any stored cards or loyalty you earned in the final round into your Collegium, and then sort your Collegium. All yellow cards are worth 1 point each. For the white, red and brown cards, add up the total ambition and authority in each column and then double the lowest. Here white is worth 6, red is worth 9 and brown is worth 5. 5 is the lowest, so for all of these, the player would gain 10 points. For allegiance tiles, score the points showing in the top right corners. And for each pair matching that shown on the senate tile, gain a bonus 3 points. Here it's red and brown, so one pair for 3 points. Finally, gain 1 point for each leftover coin. The player with the highest score wins, and in the event of a tie, most combined ambition and authority breaks the tie, and if still tied, whoever has the most leftover influence is the winner. The basic game plays 3 to 5 players, but you can play with 2 players using a third shared player who will always be one of the suitors. In any given round, whichever player is the suitor will also control the shared suitor player. All normal rules apply to the shared suitor. They'll have a collection of money which whoever is controlling the player gets to spend on buildings, and has an income of influence which the suitor player controls. You'll skip the suitor negotiation phase because the suitor player has full choice for which cards and cubes are played by both of the suitors. If the shared suitor would ever become the Imperium Myas, then instead the other suitor player becomes the Imperium Myas but does not get the money or points reward. At the end of the game, you won't total the shared suitor's score. Only one of the human players can win the game. And that's how to play 44 BCE. Check out the project page of 44 BCE. We'll put the link in the description below so you can check it out. If you find this video useful, please help us by hitting that like button and subscribe to the Dice Tower if you haven't already done so. And if you have any questions, comments or feedback, please leave that in the comments section below. Thanks for watching and see you next time.